Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Thank you for welcoming us into your home for a time of prayer, worship and reflection. We worship with you in All Saints Kings Heath, in the suburb of South Birmingham, where since the 19th century, people of diverse economic means, class and ethnicity have been jumbled up in a rather lovely way. All Saints is by no means a congregation of one unified opinion. But this parish has had a long thread of pacifism weaving through its story. We try to be politically alert and socially aware, if not always agreeing. We at least agree to think hard together about such things. We are, like all of you, deeply anxious about war at the edge of Europe at the moment, which challenges us to search our hearts about what the desire for peace means politically and practically. Today's reading from Acts compels us to reflect on how we pray for soldiers and whom we are ready to welcome and learn from. We are also very aware that Ukraine eclipses many other needs and conflicts which we must also hold in our gaze. Today marks the beginning of Christian Aid Week, the focus of which is Christian Aid's life-giving work in Zimbabwe, which is my home country. To celebrate this, several of our musical prayers and songs, including this one, are from there.
echo after that joyful song. We accept there is no one like Jesus. Yet remember we are called to be like him. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. We pause to acknowledge the ways in which we eclipse God's love in our lives. The Kyrie we sing in our confession is from the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. When we enjoy something not because it's good, but because others don't have it. God have mercy. expect others to do the dirty work, but then criticize them for it. Christ, have mercy. others to excuse mistreatment or exclusion. God have mercy. God of love, bring you back to himself, forgive you your sins, and assure you of his eternal love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And a prayer for the fifth Sunday of Easter. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, have overcome death, and open to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that as by your grace going before us, you put into our minds good desires, so by your continual help, we may bring them to good effect, through Jesus Christ our risen Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Acts 11. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went to, up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticised him, saying, Why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners. It came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed men, four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles and birds in the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, No. By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must call, not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled again, up again to heaven, 
At that very moment, three men sent me from Caesarea arrived from the house where we were. The spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. Six brothers also accompanied me and we were and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house saying, Send to, to Joppa and bring Simon who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, ju just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I can hide under God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And then they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles and repellents that the leaders to life. The man whom Peter visited, Acts chapter 10 explains, was a disarmingly humble but very senior soldier called Cornelius. It set us thinking about the friends in our fellowship today who serve with the armed forces. I'm proud of Amelia and Benjamin who read the Acts reading for us. Their dad serves with the Royal Navy and is at sea at the moment. I'm delighted to introduce you to their mum, Kim. Kim, hello. Thank you for your welcome. We're in the lull between work and the children getting back from school. So tell us what you do for a living. Um, so I'm a business manager for an orthopaedic company. Right. And um, how long have you been married to Derek and when did he join the Navy? Um, so he's been in the Navy now for 22 years. Um, and yeah, I've been with Derek since 2006. So, so you did years. know what you were getting into? Yes, yes I did. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, what do the children know about his work and what do you think they're proud of? Um, they, they know he's in the armed forces. Mm. They know that he's, he's here to sort of help. Um, and yeah, they, um, they, they know what he does and they know he's an engineer um, and they, they're just proud that he's um, just sort of part of a, a much bigger picture. Well, we know Derek as a warm-hearted friend at All Saints. The armed forces are necessarily hierarchical and could be thought of as a harsh environment. So how do you think Derek and his colleagues sustain themselves and keep a, a sort of emotional balance in their working life? Um, they, they obviously work hard. Um, when they are then have any downtime, they, um, they make sure that they can decompress and do that as well. They also have um, a chaplain that they can turn to, um, as well as divisional officers that will um, help them um, with anything that they need. Tell us how back home here you and Amelia and Benjamin sustain yourselves when dad's away and, and, and what do you need from people around you, including church? Um, it's, it, it can be difficult. Um, the children's needs are different um, as their ages change, as they understand more um, and sometimes even how they um, understand the the time lapse mm. um, so sometimes sometimes it's easier sometimes it's a little bit more challenging mm. um, and it's hard the hardest part is saying goodbye mm. um, because they know then it's going to be a while mm. um, I think in the day and age we've got with um, being able to use emails and FaceTime um, when they are able um, I think it makes it a lot easier mm. um, and it's it's just trying to take into consideration what they are going through sometimes um, as they go through the roller coaster through a deployment. Um, but we, you, you do need lots of support around you. Um, you need that emotional support. Um, you need your faith to be able to sort of guide through the strength um, that you need at times. Um, but I think it, it definitely sort of helps um, from lots of different dimensions. Mm. 
If it's not too intrusive to ask, I can't help wondering how you and all the partners of military personnel hold the worry while they're away for a long time, what they might be asked to do, where they might be. How do you sort of manage that worry and, and help the children not to be overcome by it? Um, I think that it's just trying to, to keep positive, um, to not dwell on what might be. Um, and with the, the children not hiding, but sheltering um, sometimes with what's happening with the world the way it is at the moment. There's lots of questions. Um, probably more than I've dealt with before, um, but it's yeah, just trying to put it sort of all in um, perspective. Not hiding, but sheltering is a phrase that will stay with me for a long time. Thank you for that. Um, tell us how Benjamin and Amelia like to welcome Dad home, and what they like best about leave. Oh, um, we we always try and go to. Um, sort of pick him up from wherever he's sort of coming from so they get really excited um, about that we usually they usually like to try and make a cake or um, do something special for when he we then bring him home um, and yeah they'll have a list of things that they want to go through um, I usually have a list of jobs <laughs> um, that need picking up on. Um, they come up with the more fun things. <laughs> That's wonderful. Kim, thank you for an honest uh, and, and warm glimpse of uh, life in a Royal Navy family. Thank you. What an extraordinary moment in the life of the young church our Acts reading shows. Peter says his vision happened three times. And Luke uses a lot of parchment to recall this triple vision twice in the space of two chapters. The vision leading to Peter's visit to Italian centurion Cornelius, then to his conversation with his fellow apostles back home, is clearly for Luke something that deserves, deserves huge emphasis because it reveals something fundamental in the character of the embryonic church. The power of Peter's visiting, eating with and baptizing a man who is not only foreign, but who is a senior officer in the outfit that executed Jesus is overwhelming. Who is the good news for? Friends and family of Jesus? Well, yes, but also for Gentiles, for the thief who died beside him for the other centurion who participated in the execution, but at least acknowledged Jesus' innocence. And now for this senior officer of the deadly force still occupying the land of Jesus' birth. Luke wants us to feel how such grace reaching across boundaries is transformative. Again, All Saints is not a place of uniform opinion. And we claim no superiority. We're on a journey. Like many a congregation, we've thought long and hard about who the church willfully and unwittingly excludes. When his colleagues criticised him for eating with, let alone baptising Cornelius, Peter's heartfelt response to the well-meaning but exclusive faithful was to say, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. If God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed, who was I that I should hinder God? Fundamental to the life of the church for Luke is the church's surprise as it learns to learn about God from unexpected people. Even Gentiles? Yes. Even Roman soldiers? Yes. This congregation has long felt the same about ordination. Seeing the Spirit's work in the lives and calling of women for decades in the 20th century, All Saints members wanted the Church to say, Who are we to hinder God? At last, the Church of England has embraced Peter's words, and we ordain women deacon, priest, and bishop. 
we may be very clear in the Ukrainian conflict about who is at fault and who we are determined will win. For a church like ours though, some of whose members have demonstrated outside Midlands weapons factories, we feel our pacifist leanings deeply challenged. What are we to pray about the lethal equipment sent to Ukraine to help them fend off President Putin's wicked aggression? In response, we alighted on one soldier's beautiful prayer, which may not only be offered to military personnel to pray with, but can shape and inform our prayers for them at a time like this. It's Psalm 144.
we might recoil at the opening blessing, but give thanks for God training hands for war and fingers for battle. But staying with it for a while, we realise it's an acknowledgement that all human skill is God-given. The question is, how do we use it? It reminds me of a conversation with an artilleryman who talked about his careful range finding. Accuracy saves lives, he said. So this verse gives us something very specific to pray. But in fighting, skill might minimize what is hideously termed collateral damage. Then he calls God his fortress, stronghold and shield. This soldier poet knows that all the military kit in the world cannot protect his soul. And that's what really matters. Then comes a reflection that every human life is fleeting. Subtly, humbly, the humanity of both friend and foe is asserted. This perspective doesn't prevent him from being critical of his opponent. He asks for God's help, deeply frustrated at the lies and falsehoods his enemy peddles. We can quickly empathize. Revolted by President Putin's righteous tones and absurd narrative, doing terrible violence to Ukraine while deceiving his own people. But that emphasis first on our common humanity just tugs the soldier, and maybe us, back from dehumanizing and demonizing the enemy. Having candidly asked God for help, in the back of our minds now, the thought that Russian soldiers too are praying out of their vulnerable humanity. This soldier establishes the purpose of the conflict. It is to achieve a peace where the agriculture, like that of abundantly fertile Ukraine, can flourish. A peace where broken down walls are mended, where children live with dignity. It is a prayer ensuring the soldier's heart never settles on conflict as an end in itself. Beautifully, unbearably poignantly, the soldier dreams of the day he can turn his skilled fingers from weaponry to musical instruments. Like that Ukrainian soldier playing the piano in a bombed out school, this is the faithful soldier's prayer as he faces conflict. He knows where his humanity lies. If we're going to ask people to head towards conflict for our protection, we need to cherish their souls and protect their hearts. This prayer might help us to do so. It gives us specific things to pray and might prepare our hearts to honour them and welcome them home. If we're going to have an army, we might be glad to think of military personnel praying in such a way. Peter baptized Gentile soldier Cornelius and the church learns to cherish him. Luke invites us never to stop learning how to cherish one another. When this present conflict ceases, living in the power of Jesus' resurrection, a prayer like this will make our hearts ready to relearn what it means to cherish Russia.
As we affirm our faith, if you're able, you might like to turn to face east, where conflict continues as we say the first phrase, asserting our common humanity. Then for the second, cross your arms over your heart to feel Christ's company with you. Then for the third, imagining the Holy Spirit's energy, we turn to face south towards Zimbabwe and Christian Aid's life-giving service with the partners there. We, we believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and is saved. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Zimbabwean sung response in prayer means, Jesus, we are here for you. In other words, with each prayer, we offer ourselves to be part of the answer. We pray. God, you sent Cornelius to the early church, broadening their horizons and deepening their prayer. Raise up humble, faithful people like him in armed forces the world over. 
especially those which, like Rome, presume to occupy others' land. We pray for all engaged in combat, that skill in war may save more lives than it takes. We pray for the mental health of those seeking refuge from conflict or returning from battle. Cherish their souls and surround them with communities of prayer and patience. Compassion and wisdom where they may rediscover your praise and turn their skills once more to creativity and playfulness. Yeah. Hear all who cry to you in frustration and hurt, angered by lies and senseless devastation. Understand their visceral anger. Do not let bitterness take hold. Honor their humanity and send them the company and help they need, if you will, through us and all our neighbors. We pray for those struggling with the consequences, not only of war, but of climate change, the long-term consequences of past political strife, and any imbalances and injustices of worldwide trade. Honor the work of Christian aid, Islamic relief, Red Crescent, Red Cross, and all who seek the welfare of the poorest. Bless Christian aid this week, and as we collect money for their work, God, collect the prayers of people of every faith and respond with your spirit to breathe new life into Zimbabwe and every land. We conclude with the Archbishop's prayer for Ukraine. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear, 
that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. In the language of our hearts, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Baba wedu urikudenga, zitara kongari eriswe, umambo wako hushike, kuda kwa konga kuitwe, pasi so kudenga. Tipe nasi chungwa chedu uche misiese, tisu nungure shitazo shedu, sejo tinusu nungura vanu titazira, usa tutunga mizire mururu nziro. Asi tinunure mkuipa, ijo umambo uri wako, nesimba nembiri, narini narini. Amen. God, who through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ has given humanity, not the victory we want, but the victory we need, give you joy and peace in your faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, and all for whom you pray, now and always. <laughs>